This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Cardiovascular Grand Rounds. Uh, this morning we have Mike Hoskins with us, and uh, I think all of you know that Dr. Hoskins is one of our very talented uh, clinical EP folks here. He uh, did his medical school in Wisconsin and then did all of his postgraduate training, internship, residency, fellowship, and EP here at Emory. Um, Michael is uh, going to tell us about, uh, I think, one of the evolving and confusing areas that's going on now, which is all about left atrial appendage closures and, you know, I guess, all the different flavors available and successes and what we should be doing, right? Okay. Dr. Hoskins. Thanks, Dr. Taylor. So I thought it would be timely to talk about what's going on in the field of left atrial appendage closure after some discussions with our colleagues and questions as to whether we're doing this, whether this technology is, is viable, and what the success rates are. So just a little caveat that a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is the Watchman device because that's really dominated the literature and the data that we have right now. I don't have any financial relationships with any of the products that we'll be talking about except for the fact that we are participating in clinical trials with these products. So learning objectives, we need learning objectives for grand rounds. So we want you to understand the role of the appendage both in stroke and in atrial fibrillation itself be able to understand the rec and recognize the current strategies that we have for left atrial appendage occlusion, and then what we think is coming down the pipeline in the future in this field. So here's the outline for today. We're going to go over some mandatory epidemiology of AFib and highlight some of the current situations with anticoagulation and bleeding. Talk a little bit about the appendage itself. I think that's important to understand what the structure is. And then the currently available strategies for left atrial appendage closure. What we're looking for when we get follow-up imaging. Why don't we just leave things alone at the time of the procedure. And then one thing that we feel that's important is the role of appendage closure as part of a comprehensive AFib management program rather than just closing the device and sending the patient on their way. And then some areas of interest in the future. So. How common is AFib? Well, one thing I like to tell my patients is if you're a middle-aged male, your likelihood of getting AFib in your lifetime is about one in five. So it's <coughs> relatively common and more common than patients often realize. So when you have a patient in their 70s or 80s come in and they have atrial fibrillation, a lot of them are starting to find out that their friends have AFib and, and that it really is very common. This is all Framingham data. And of course, the incidence um, or the prevalence goes up with increasing age. The hang up with atrial fibrillation is that it results in hospitalizations. So the older you are, the more likely you are to be hospitalized with AFib. And most of these hospitalizations are due to symptoms and stroke. And there is a, a slight uptick in the number of hospitalizations in recent years, particularly in elderly patients. A lot of this is because we're finding more AFib now. We have better tools at identifying AFib that may come and go and not be clinically relevant when the patient comes into clinic. We all know that AFib is associated with stroke, and age is one of the predictors of stroke with AFib. Your chance of having a stroke goes up with increasing age. And when you have a stroke, this is important that Strokes from AFib are different animals than, than garden variety strokes. These tend to be very large cortical strokes, often bilateral strokes, and they're associated with basically every bad marker that you can think of with strokes in terms of increased mortality, dementia, the likelihood of being bedridden, and the length of hospitalization. So most people are familiar with the tools we use to estimate someone's risk of stroke. We have the CHAD score, which is very simple, and now the CHAD's VAS score, with, which most of us are using. And these are the components of the CHAD's VAS score. Just a few words, congestive heart failure does not necessarily mean low ejection fraction. Diastolic heart failure counts in the CHAD's VAS score. And now patients get a point for being 65 
whereas you used to have to get to 75, we have an added point for 65. And so 75 year olds actually have two points for age. And then uh, female gender is, is another component of that scoring system. And this is something you can do very easily with your initial interview of the patient. You can, as you're talking to them, try to calculate what their risk of stroke is. And there's some pretty easy guidelines that if you have a score of one or more, you should consider anticoagulation in those patients. We don't have a lot of great data for using aspirin only in patients with CHADS VAS scores of one. So we tend to be more aggressive with the anticoagulation and now with these newer agents that are, have a lower risk of bleeding, we tend to nudge patients towards anticoagulation even if they have a CHADS VAS of one. The CHADS VAS score does not include all the risk factors for stroke. Sleep apnea is a risk factor for stroke and in this study of 5,200 patients, sleep apnea and age were the strongest predictors of stroke. And in a multivariate model, sleep apnea was a predictor on its own for stroke. So don't forget about sleep apnea. Ask patients if they snore, refer them for sleep studies because that may swing you one way or another. So the CHADS VAS score is also not the only thing that you should use. You talk to your patients and try to get a sense of what their individual risk of stroke is because the CHADS VAS score is a population-based scoring model. So these are two patients who, I didn't realize this until I was putting this talk together, that actually had TEs only a couple weeks apart from each other, but these are two patients. The one on the left is 74 years old. The one on the right is 67 years old. Both of them have permanent AFib and are on, at this time, rivaroxaban at the time of these studies. They both have hypertension, congestive heart failure, and they've both had TIAs. And so if you look at this patient's transesophageal echo, here is his appendage. And this thing is beating very vigorously. The velocities on this thing are off the scale for um, the scale system that they use. As opposed to this patient with the same CHADS VAS score, very sluggish flow in the atrium, a lot of smoke on TE, and either smoke or thrombus in the appendage. We actually did a, a series of tests to figure out what exactly this was down here. But these patients, if you just look at them on paper, have the same risk of stroke, but I think everyone would agree that the one on the right has a higher individual risk of stroke. The corollary to the CHADS VAS score is the HASBLED score, and this is a, another easy bedside tool that you can use to estimate someone's risk of bleeding when you're placing them on anticoagulation. And there's a, there's a number of these tools that are used. The one that I use is the HASBLED score because it's easy. A lot of the components are the same as the CHADS VAS score. And not surprisingly, the more points that you get, the higher your risk of bleeding. One rule of thumb is if your HASBLED score is higher than your CHAD score, your risk of bleeding on anticoagulation is higher than your risk of stroke. So keep that in mind when you talk to patients about that. The other thing is, Elderly patients are on here, but falls are not on here. So we tend to overestimate the risk of bleeding from falls. That's been shown in series after series. It takes a, a, an unusually high number of falls to create one clinical event on anticoagulation. So very briefly reviewing the data for anticoagulants. These are the novel anticoagulants versus warfarin. And the pool data suggests that the novel anticoagulants are superior in terms of preventing stroke and also superior in terms of bleeding. And most of the superiority is driven by apixaban. The others tend to overlap on one or the other, but the pooled data is favorable for novel anticoagulants. The majority of the benefit from novel anticoagulants is a reduction in intracranial hemorrhage. So that drives the efficacy and the safety for those agents. And one thing that we have seen clinically is that they do tend to have a higher risk of GI bleeding. So keep that in mind when you're selecting these agents. One of the issues with anticoagulants is people are, are under-prescribed anticoagulants. So even in patients with very high CHADS VAS scores, there's really a plateau of about 50% of eligible patients that are on anticoagulation. 
This is, is recent data from 2016. I don't think this matches the clinical practice we see here where most, this is most patients on warfarin. I think our population has a higher percentage of novel anticoagulants, but this concept of about half the people who are eligible for anticoagulation actually being prescribed it is a consistent thing in the literature that we see. The other thing that we see is once prescribed, patients often come off these medications. So this was a series sponsored by the American Heart Association, a real world analysis of patients on anticoagulation. And apixaban had the best adherence profile, but it's only about 50% compared to warfarin, which is down into the 20s to 30s. And that increases over time. So patients on both types of agents tend to come off these medications over time, more so with warfarin than the novel anticoagulants. But it's not really difficult to imagine this data as a rationale for closing the left atrial appendage. We know that stroke rates remain high, even on anticoagulation with high-risk patients. Everyone has seen patients where the bleeding risk is unacceptably high. And then patients on warfarin are actually therapeutic a very small percentage of the time, roughly 50 to 60 percent in all of the novel anticoagulant trials. You'd be pleased to hear that that number is greater than 80 percent in our anticoagulation clinic. So that's, that's admirable because these clinical trials are very regimented. So our staff in the anticoagulation clinic, hats off to you. And then this consistent theme that anticoagulation is underutilized in eligible patients and that's a combination of patient and physician factors. So let's talk a little bit about the appendage itself. One of the questions we talk about in our group and surprisingly a very common question that patients have is why this thing is, is there if it all it does is cause strokes. And we know that embryologically the left atrial appendage is actually the left atrium. And that as we develop the left atrium in adults be, is uh, originated from pulmonary venous tissue and that the primordial left atrium becomes the actual appendage in adults. And so this has some purpose, at least embryologically and probably um, evolutionarily. We know that the appendage does contract, so it adds some contractile function for atrial transport. You can now measure that very easily with MRI. It's difficult to do with echo. The appendage is more compliant than the left atrium. The left atrium is somewhat of a wall of muscle and the appendage is a little bit stretchy. And as it stretches, there are these granules of ANP within the wall of the appendage. So as the left atrial pressure goes up and the appendage stretches, they release atrial natriuretic peptide, which may help with diuresis. And now we're learning also that the appendage is involved in the genesis of atrial fibrillation itself. <clears throat> but we know that the main purpose of the appendage is to cause strokes, and it's estimated that somewhere around 90 to 95 percent of strokes in patients with AFib come from clots in the left atrial appendage. And even smoke on, on TE, although it may not be actual thrombus, it is associated with an increased risk of stroke. So what happens to the left atrium after you remove the appendage? Well, this is data from dogs. And if you surgically remove the left atrial appendage, the compliance of the left atrium actually worsens. Now, for whatever reason, the surgical literature in humans is the opposite. So that if you remove the appendage, left atrial function tends to improve. And there's some data coming out that the same may be true for catheter-based closure techniques. So in patients who've undergone Watchman procedure, you can measure the atrial contraction strain as a function of left atrial transport, and it improves acutely and then long-term in these patients. So there may be some, some physical benefit of, or hemodynamic benefit of closing the left atrium. One of the things that we think is neat is looking at the different types of appendage or different shapes. And, and all of us have an appendage that looks very different from the next person. Each column in this figure is one appendage looked at in three different ways. And so you can see that on TE, you can start to get a correlation with CT of what these things look like. And there have been names 
proposed for these different shapes, trying to classify them. We like to classify things. So this thing would be called a cauliflower shape, if you hear us talking about that. This would be a windsock, so a very simple appendage. This would be called a cactus shape with a somewhat of a stalk and then a bunch of little frills at the end. And then there are things we call a chicken wing where there are secondary bends on the appendage itself. And it's challenging to figure out what you're dealing with. So this is a patient where we have three different TE images. This is one of our patients. And it certainly looks like this is a simple windsock type appendage, a straight tubular structure. But when you actually inject contrast and do an angiogram of the appendage, you can see that it's not so simple. And there's all sorts of little smaller lobes at the distal end of this appendage. And so what we thought was a tubular structure is actually a very complex structure. So TE is helpful for the proximal portions of the appendage, but it can mislead you when you're looking at the more distal portions. So angiograms are important. This is one of my favorite images that we've had, and we like to do little mini Rorschach tests with the fellows when we do these. So the fellow in this case said, well, this isn't a chicken wing. It actually looks like a full chicken if you look at it. And I think if you play this, you can kind of appreciate a little chicken there. So they can get interesting. So CT has helped us, and we can get great three-dimensional images of the appendage. So I'll pause this here. And this is the appendage here. And the useful thing with these studies is you can see where it is relative to the other cardiac structure. So where it is relative to the sternum, to the rest of the heart, to the pulmonary artery, that's important often. You can kind of see which direction it's pointing, how many lobes it has, very accurately measure the size. And for some of the techniques that we use, this is critical information. A lot of the information we can get for the Watchman device and some of the newer ones we could just get from transesophageal echo. But CT has been helpful. So one thing that has not been well described, but certainly is not surprising, that the shape of this thing would somehow impact the patient's risk of stroke. And this isn't something that we take into clinical practice, but it does make sense that some of these shapes may place the patient at an increased risk of stroke. And I think if, if I were to be asked before seeing this data which would be the lowest risk of stroke, I would probably say the windsock, because there doesn't seem to be a lot of these little pouches, but it actually is the chicken wing shape, at least based on this series. So this was about 200 patients who were undergoing AFib ablations and just had a CT scan <coughs> done as part of their preparation for that procedure. And then they looked at the patient's risk of stroke, and the chicken wing was a predictor for low risk of stroke. And everything else is a threefold times higher. And it, it may be that there are thrombi that can form in those just the little pouches, but because it takes several twists and turns to actually get out, the stroke does not occur. There are other risk factors that have been identified for looking at thrombus in the appendage, so reduced LVEF, that's part of the CHADS vascor, but also elevated left atrial pressure, reduced velocities in the appendage, reduced appendage ejection fraction, which can now be measured with imaging a smaller orifice diameter is associated with a higher risk of thrombus formation and potentially stroke. And thrombus can form very quickly. So if you do a TE in someone with acute AFib of less than three days, not on anticoagulation, a sizable portion of those patients will have a thrombus present. That's why it's important to either get them out of AFib or place them very quickly on anticoagulation. And this is one reason, at least in my practice, anyone who has AFib, at least initially, I like to place on anticoagulation because we know thrombus can form so quickly. And then one scary piece of data is a non-trivial portion of patients on full anticoagulation for what we presume to be a sufficient period of time actually have thrombus. So this data is from patients getting an AFib ablation who had a TEE just prior to the ablation. Now, we don't do that routinely, but it may be a good thing that we don't look because there are at least a small portion of patients that have thrombus, even though they're on anticoagulation.
So Nabil Sabak is one of the residents that's working with us and he's done a lot of work on evaluating kind of the business end of the appendage, which is the osteum. So we think of all these complex structures from a three-dimensional standpoint, but a lot of what we're concerned with is what it looks like looking down the pipe. And so we think of the osteum of the appendage is kind of like a circle, but we know that it's very much not the case. So in our patients at Emory, this is the most circular kind that we've seen. This is the other extreme that we've seen, a very narrow, almost slit-like structure. And these, I tried to make these shapes to scale. This is kind of the average Joe appendage that we see. It is elongated in, in terms of its osteum. It's not circular and it's roughly two and a half centimeters in length. We'll talk about why that's important. But if you think about these little pouches as great sources for thrombus formation in the appendage, we often think about it in, in a form like this as a negative cast of the appendage. But the appendage isn't a feathery little structure if you look at it on the outside of the heart. It's actually relatively smooth. And the way I like to think of it is a thin membrane structure that's partitioned by little pectinate muscles. And so if you look at TEE, you're seeing these things that protrude into the appendage, but the outer portion is relatively smooth. Here's a mock-up of an actual heart that's been excised, and then we're looking down the appendage with the lights off inside the heart and lights on outside the heart. And you can see that how thin this structure is when you can actually see light through the wall of the appendage. And so you can start to imagine kind of a thin membrane with these pectinate muscles that are invaginating into the structure. <clears throat> so when we were fellows, I remember getting, um, hearing from the back of the room about getting out of the appendage as quickly as we could with a catheter because of concern for perforation. And this is a, a pig heart and I don't know if you can appreciate how thin it is, but you can see the blue of my glove through the wall of that appendage. It's a little bit shiny with the light shining on it. But it's very, very thin. And so we actually tried to perforate that thing with a standard ablation catheter. And I have to say it was actually very challenging to do. We, it took some effort, and this is the, the final try that we had where we, after some efforts, were able to perforate this thing. But it took a fair bit of pressure on that wall of the appendage. And now this isn't an actual beating heart, so there are maybe some inaccuracies as to how clinically relevant this is, but it's more forgiving than you might expect. And just as a point of comparison, this is the left ventricle of the same animal, and the catheter goes right through. So it's surprisingly robust structure, and it may be that the lack of muscle fibers and the more dense connective tissue adds to support for this, to some support for the structure. Okay, so let's talk about what we have currently available for closing the appendage. And it's important to understand the history of this concept. The Cox Maze series of, of procedures actually incorporated surgical excision of the appendage, mostly because of concern for risk of stroke, but it may have had an antirhythmic effect as we'll show you. But the surgeons have the ability to directly look at this thing, so it closed. They can cut the thing off, so there's no chance of a leak through there. But when they do this, it's in an open heart. It's not a beating heart. They don't have real-time echo data that they're using. They do have the ability to put this thing called an atria clip around the base of the appendage with a thoroscopic approach that doesn't require open heart surgery. But largely, this group of data has not been randomized to standard anticoagulation therapy. So we, we know that it actually works, though. If you look at pooled data from non-randomized series, you can see that the stroke rate at 30 days is lower in the group that, that had their appendage excised, which isn't surprising. But the mortality rate in those patients is actually lower, too. Now, because this isn't randomized data, it's hard to know exactly what that means. But... It, it actually does work pretty well. The first transcatheter approach that was developed is the Play-Doh device, and this is near and dear to Emory. Dr. Langberg was involved in the development of this device and 
Dr. Block was the lead author on this paper. And I remember as a fellow rotating through ECHO doing the TEEs on these patients pre and post, and it was kind of neat to see. And the device actually worked pretty well. This was a non-randomized trial for patients who were felt to be poor anticoagulant candidates. And if you look at the rate of stroke in the, in the patients who received the device, it was about half of the expected stroke rate based on the CHAD score. The CHAD's VAS score didn't really, wasn't really in play at the time, but it did seem to reduce the risk of stroke in those patients. And they were very stringent on their echo criteria for leaks around this device. They did a very thorough job at, at looking at this. And patients over time did fairly well. I mean, this was a fairly sick group of people, as you can imagine. And major adverse events were not extremely common, even out to five years. And I don't know why this device is not still around. I anticipate it has, there are probably some business decisions that were involved in that. But industry, like life, will go on. And now the Watchman device is kind of the, the, the um, successor of that. And this is really what we base a lot of our trial data on is, is data from the Watchman technology. So the first trial that looked at this technology was the PROTECT AF trial. And this was patients who were felt to be a little bit high risk for anticoagulation but could still take anticoagulation. And they were randomized either to warfarin therapy or to the Watchman device therapy. And it was designed to be non-inferior. That's important. And what they found was that in terms of preventing stroke and systemic embolization and death, it was non-inferior. It wasn't better, but it was non-inferior. But the big concern with this trial is right here. The safety data was not great with this trial. And you can see that there was a huge spike in safety outcomes in the periprocedural period. And the vast majority of these were bleeding. So when you have a almost 10% risk of having a bad outcome from the procedure, that's not a viable option long term. But we were encouraged by the data that in terms of its efficacy. So if you look at the numbers, the efficacy was there were three events for every 100 patient years in the intervention group and 4.9 in the Coumadin group and that was non-inferior. If you actually look at the people who had a successful procedure it was actually pretty good. So 1.9 events in the Watchman arm and 4.6 in the Warfarin arm. But here is the hang up. The safety endpoints were not great. And so the FDA asked for more data. Now, importantly, if you look at the patients that were enrolled in the first half of that trial, they, were, they did much worse than the patients enrolled in the second half. So this lower, bot lower uh, dotted line is the patients enrolled in the first half of the trial. They had a higher rate of bad safety endpoints as opposed to the solid line, which was the second half of the trial. And then a, a registry that followed soon after this trial, they did even better, the same patient population. So there is a little bit of a learning curve with this technique. And I think a lot of it was just a respect for what they were doing with the procedure and understanding how that device works in the appendage. I'll show you, show you some of the pitfalls that you can run into. But the FDA asked for more data, and so the PREVAIL trial was designed essentially in the same way, randomized either Warfarin or Watchman. But the stipulation with this trial is a sizable portion of the implanters had to be new implanters. So they wanted to see how this was going to work in the real world. And they were banking on the fact that they had learned from their initial experience and that they could reduce bleeding episodes. Now, interestingly, the trial did not meet statistical non-inferiority for the overall primary endpoint, but it was not inferior to warfarin when you look at just stroke and strokes that happened a week or more down the road. But the big thing was that the safety profile was much better. So now we have a 2% um, incidence of safety endpoints and, and a very small number of embolizations and bleeding. So they learned from what they uh, saw with the PROTECT AF, but you have to wonder how this device ever got approved if it had borderline non-inferiority related to warfarin. And so three things happened in order for that to happen. So one is they looked at the warfarin arm of that PREVAIL trial, that second trial that I just showed you, and they saw that the stroke rate in that arm was actually much lower than anything 
that had been seen before. So the stroke rate in the warfarin arms of all the novel anticoagulant trials was about one to one and a half for every 100 patient years. And it was only 0 0.3 in the PREVAIL trial. So the bar being set by the control group was much higher than anything we had seen before, even though these patients were relatively high risk with an average CHADS VAS score of 2.6 in the PREVAIL trial. The second thing is they looked at the pooled data from the two trials. So we have one that shows pretty good efficacy and the next that, that is improving on safety. And you could see that the rate of hemorrhagic stroke was much better in the watchman arm. And bleeding was actually better if you got rid of the procedural bleeding rate. So if you could do the procedure safely, the patients actually did well. And actually there was a signal that there may be a mortality benefit with this, with this um, technology. And then the third thing that happened is we had longer term data. So there were five year data that came out. The, the mean follow up in this cohort was 3.8 years. And the, the rate of stroke was still the same, so they, they kind of followed the same trend in terms of the risk of stroke. But the mortality curve started to diverge, and with the warfarin mortality curve increasing relative to the Watchman device over time. That may make sense. And the primary efficacy endpoint now became superior, and the safety endpoint was really about the same. So you couldn't go back and change this early data. That was already there. But once you learn from that and once the device was in, patients actually did very well over time as opposed to patients on warfarin, which were continuously exposed to the risks of anticoagulation. And then if you look at all the cohorts with this device, the rate of stroke tends to follow the expected rate of stroke on anticoagulation. So over several different series and cohorts, it, it held right next to that line which makes scientific sense that if you're closing the source of thrombus, you could safely come off anticoagulation and have the same risk of stroke. So the FDA did approve the device, and when CMS came out with the national coverage determination, there were some interesting things on there. They were very rigid in terms of who could get this device. So you have to have a CHAD score of greater than two and a CHADS VAS score of at least three. So even though you may recommend anticoagulation for patients lower than that, this is the criteria that CMS determined was necessary in order for payment for the device. You had to be, and you still do, have to be eligible for short-term anticoagulation because they're following the trials. And it's actually very <coughs> uncommon for someone not to be able to take anticoagulation for six weeks or so after the procedure, although those patients are out there. They require that you have to have a structural heart or an EP team that's, that is experienced with transeptal puncture. All the patients have to be in a registry. And then one of the unique things that some of you may have been part of is the shared decision-making discussion that has to be documented. So that a third party, an additional cardiologist, not implanting the device, has to have a discussion with the patient talking about risks and benefits of anticoagulation and that has to be documented in the medical record. So I'm going to distill the procedure itself down to just 30 seconds or so. And um, basically all we do is we take an image of the actual appendage. This is a fairly simple windsock type appendage. And knowing that we have a little bit more room than we thought in the past in terms of robustness of the appendage, we can really get out there into the distal edges of the appendage, which is important because when you actually deploy the device, these feet on the device are sticking straight out. And so it's really not a good idea to advance that thing. So you really have to start as far out in the appendage as you possibly can and then unsheath the device until it opens. <coughs> And then you take some, in, some final shots and you can see that the appendage is completely occluded. There is some dye that goes through the outer cap of the device, which is not solid, it's a fabric. And so dye will always flow through that in the beginning, but we're not seeing any flow around the edges of the device. So this is completely occluded and that patient's gonna do great. When you look at the echo images afterwards, this is what we like to see. That thing is in there pretty tight you can get a sense of the shape of it. It's really kind of wedged in there. And we're looking for a variety of things on echo. The, the echo is actually uh, 
at least presently, really important information in terms of the acute success of that procedure. And the things that we look at are number one is their flow around the device. And now you can get flow around the rim of the device as it slides around the side, but what you're trying to avoid is flow behind the device in the appendage itself. And the rate of that happening acutely is actually very low. Then we take some measurements and we calculate how compressed that device is because one of the main stability portions is, is axial compression on the device. So we want that appendage really grabbing the periphery of the device and holding it in there. And then we actually kind of tug on it a little bit to be sure that it's not going anywhere. And if you pass these criteria, the, the chance of this thing embolizing is actually very low. It's not zero, but it's close to zero percent. So when patients come back, one of the neat things that I did not anticipate seeing is how happy these patients are to come off anticoagulation. It's one of the more rewarding things that I've seen where they come back for their follow-up TE, you tell them that they don't need anticoagulation and it's just like the best day for them. And that's been objectively measured. Their, their quality of life is, is better after a, a Watchman device compared to the same patient population on Warfarin, and maybe the better way to say this is they lack the negative quality of life impact of anticoagulation. But it certainly is a good day for all when you can tell them that. In terms of cost effectiveness, there have been some evaluations of, the, of that initial PROTECT cohort. And if you were to do a cost evaluation the day after the procedure, it would not be cost effective. But if you give it some time, it may be, and so they, this group did a, an evaluation using current payment methods and looking over 20 years, and they found that closure of the appendage with the Watchman device in particular compared to Warfarin was more effective and less expensive projected over 20 years. So you want to be on these figures, you want to be down in this corner. This is a good corner, this is bad, and, and the Watchman device was was um, favorable compared to warfarin. Compared to NOAX, it was slightly less effective, but not surprisingly better cost effective. So that was interesting. And then just as a point of reference, they compared NOAX to warfarin and not surprisingly, they're uh, more expensive with slightly better efficacy than warfarin. So it does seem to be cost effective if you give that patient enough time horizon the benefit from it. So for patients who can't take any anticoagulation, which is not common, there is hope. And this was a registry or a feasibility study done in Europe for patients who were not anticoagulation candidates at all. It was not randomized. Patients just got a Watchman device and then were placed on dual antiplatelet therapy. And so their average CHAS VAS score is 4.4, which is pretty high. The stroke rate for someone like that would be around 5 or 6 percent. And the stroke rate in the trial was 2.3 percent. So these were patients who didn't get any anticoagulation at all, and they actually did very well. This, this trial is actually being done as, as a randomized control trial in the U.S. right now that we are enrolling in for patients who cannot take any anticoagulation at all, where they get randomized to the device or just placed on aspirin and Plavix alone. So when we get our follow-up imaging, the ECHO, our ECHO colleagues have really helped us a lot learning about these devices, and we're really looking for two things, leaks and clots. And this is the strategy that we use. So we implant the device at day zero and all patients go home on anticoagulation. You're supposed to use warfarin, but we've actually used NOAX on a lot of these patients now and there's data coming out that that is, is safe even to do it on uninterrupted novel anticoagulants. And then after 45 days, you get a transesophageal echo and you're looking for primarily leaks, but you're also looking for thrombus. And if you see thrombus or a leak greater than five millimeters and you leave that patient on anticoagulation until those resolve. And so this is an example of what we think a thrombus looks like. This is the limbus of the, of the uh, patient here, and, and you can see a little smudge down in the corner there. We don't know if that's a thrombus 
or if that's part of the endothelial layer that's forming. But in, it's not common to see something like that, so it was a little bit unusual. We left that patient on warfarin for another six weeks and it was gone, kind of confirming that it was thrombus. The patient did fine. The overall presence of thrombus is about 3 to 5 percent, depending on when you look. So it's relatively uncommon. It can take several different forms. You can get a large chunk of clot that forms in the little vestibule that you create when you put this device in. Or another relatively common area to see thrombus is hanging off of the threaded insert on the edge of the device. But fortunately it's not real common and it actually even the patients that do have a thrombus they still have a relatively low rate of stroke. And that may be because they're left on anticoagulation. The other thing is leaks. So if you Look at an appendage, this is all the same appendage, just, look, just viewed from different angles on transesophageal echo, and you can see that at zero degrees it looks like every other appendage, but when you get up to the higher angles you start to see all the complex structure of this thing. And you try to decide what size of device to put it in, and, and the problem with this device is it has a fixed form. It's as wide as it is long, and so you need, you need enough length in your appendage to accommodate for whatever width you're selecting and you always want to oversize so you're trying to get as big of a round shape that you can in something that's not necessarily round and that may result in leaks so this is what we're looking for when we're trying to find leaks and you can see on this top video you can see a little jet that's coming from behind the appendage around the edge of the device. And so these plugs, the endocardial plugs, they not surprisingly leak around the edge. And as long as that leak is less than five millimeters in size, it has not been associated with an increased risk of stroke. So we accept leaks up to five millimeters and it's, it's actually very uncommon to see a leak of five millimeters or more. That, that's a pretty big leak when you see it. The Lariat device, on the other hand, when you see a leak with that, it's through the center. And so what clinical effect the difference in these leaks has, if any, we don't know. Fortunately, the risk of stroke is still pretty low, but they are different entities. And the rate of leaks is not insignificant. So if you look at the Watchman data, at the follow-up TEE point, about a quarter of the patients will have leaks of some size, which is a sizable portion. And that's despite having a low leak rate at the time of implant. The lariats tend to have a lower incidence of leak and the Amplatzer device which is currently in clinical trials in the data from Europe has a leak rate of about 12 percent. And so again Nabil has been working with us on looking at our data and the acute leak rate is actually very low. It's um, out of the first 115 patients that we've done commercially there were five that had leaks acutely which is comparable to data that has been seen in other series. All of these except one were one millimeter in size or less. So there was one that had a three millimeter leak, but all the others were very small. But when you look at 45 days, this goes up. And so the, the biggest one that in our series is six millimeters, which is unacceptably high, but the mean is about two and a half and it's in 25% of patients. So that's the same as in this cohort and the same that's very close to what has been seen in Protect AF which is about a third of patients. So it's not uncommon to see these leaks. Most patients can still come off anticoagulation but we've been wondering as to why these leaks form. If you have no leak at implant, why would you get a leak further down the road? And some of it may be that while the device is a fixed shape and size, the, the atrial tissue may remodel and so particularly in, in an osteum that is non-circular you may get a leak around the edge where those those uh, long axis points come. In our series we found that the chicken wing is a predictor for the presence of a leak at follow-up and so the three-dimensional structure of the appendage may affect what's going on at the osteum as well. And then things that we've identified that predict leak size include relative undersizing of the device. And there's several different ways that you can calculate that. How ovoid it is at baseline. So the more circular, the less likely there is to have a leak. Uh, 
Now the opposite is not true. The, the most ovoid group didn't necessarily have a larger leak rate, but somewhere in between they do. Age was a predictor, and then low left atrial pressure is a predictor for delayed leaks. So when you put this thing in acutely, you're, you're getting a seal based on what the hemodynamics of the patient are at the time. And, and the pressure in the left atrium may be lower when the patient's under anesthesia. So when they go home and have their hamburgers and left atrial pressure increases, you may start to form a leak around the periphery of the device. So these are the other currently available devices that are out there. The amulet, the device, is in clinical trials right now comparing head-to-head -head with the Watchman device. I'm not going to go into that device too much. It's shaped a little bit differently. It has a, a more narrow landing platform, which is potentially advantageous and disadvantageous depending on the situation. And it has this disc that is designed to cover the entire osteal region of the appendage theoretically creating a more uh, smoother surface uh, without the vestibules that you can see with the Watchman device. The Lariat device is in a different type of clinical trial right now. And um, just briefly show you how that is done. The, the Amulet device is put in the same way as the Watchman. So with the Lariat device, you need left atrial access via transeptal puncture, like anything else. And then you get pericardial axis and put a bunch of wires in there for safety. And then you take your shots and you identify where the appendage is. And you really have to kind of line up this sheath because you, you can't really steer it at all. So you have to take some time and consideration as to lining that thing up. So you point it right at the tip of the appendage. So there's a lot of efforts involved in that. And then you have a little wire on each with a magnet on the end of each wire. So one goes into the endocardial side of the appendage, one goes on the epicardial side, and they connect in the middle with a little layer of appendage tissue in between them. And then you use that as a rail to advance this loop snare over the appendage. And everyone takes a deep breath as you're doing that. And and then finally you get this snare to the ostium or, or where you want to finally land that device. And then you release the suture that's part of the snare. And then when you take a final shot in there, you can see that the appendage is completely gone. You have a nice smooth surface. There's no material on the endovascular side of this. Theoretically, you don't need anticoagulation. We're, we're often using only aspirin in these patients. And, and actually, patients do pretty well. There was this FDA alert that came out a couple years ago with this device. And so the FDA sub submitted this to the public with concern over adverse events with this technology. And they had identified 45 major adverse events, and six patients died using this technology. And there are several reasons for that, I think, um, not least of which is lack of respect for what you're doing to the patient and people who had never really been involved in this area at all, all of a sudden strangulating the appendage. And it's not difficult or challenging to imagine how things could go bad. But if you look at the data, it's actually favorable. So one of the big technical challenges is getting into the pericardial space. And historically, we've used kind of a spinal tap needle in order to get in there. And if you use a micropuncture technique with some alterations to that technique, the safety profile of gaining access to the pericardial space improves. And that was a big driver for overall safety. And so the overall total complications when using that micropuncture technique was actually very low. So it can be done safely if done correctly. So one of the things I want to take just a few minutes to talk about is our view that occluding the appendage really ought to be thought of as an overall AFib management strategy. So when we see these patients, you know, they may actually come there, come to your clinic for evaluation for this technology, but really you have to look at the overall patient, not just say we're going to put a plug in your appendage and we'll see you later. Because these patients have AFib and AFib needs to be managed. One of the things that we've seen is that the appendage itself can be a source of AFib. And this was the earliest report that I could find. Um, you know, this was known beforehand, but in the literature, the first report that I could find was in 2008. 
of a focal driver originating from the appendage itself. And this was actually from the group over in Birmingham, Alabama. And they successfully ablated this and the patient had no more AFib. And there's some emerging data that if you empirically electrically isolate the appendage at the time of an AFib ablation, that those patients may have less recurrent AFib. The problem with that is when you electrically isolate the appendage, it's not moving at all anymore. And so you have a dead vestibule, i.e. the appendage, and you can get these huge clots that form. And that's been seen in these series where they isolate. Now there are centers out there that are doing this routinely. They just electrically isolate it and um, deal with the consequences. And if you leave patients on anticoagulation, that may be less of an issue. But this image on the screen was in a patient on warfarin and they still had a huge thrombus that formed. So that's a big deal. So one of the patients that we had, this is actually from our group, a patient that had a Lariat device and then died about a year later from alcohol-related complications. His wife called me and, and asked a question because they did an autopsy in the coroner and asked her about this string on the outside of the heart that they had seen. And so we were able to get images of this patient and this was the first description of what it looks like in a human after you ligate the appendage. So this is about a year afterwards and the appendage would normally be here and it's completely gone. There's just this little flat patch there. Unfortunately she didn't get endocardial images or pictures of the heart because she didn't understand what she was looking at. But, but you can see that the appendage is completely gone. And so that is not only electrically isolated, but mechanically and physically non-existent anymore. And so people have started to wonder what would happen if you could electrically isolate this by using this technology. And it actually reduces AFib. So if you monitor someone's AFib burden on a, an implantable recorder in patients with persistent AFib, you have a substantial reduction in the burden of AFib by doing nothing more than, than that. You're not doing an AFib ablation, you're just getting rid of the appendage and whether that's getting rid of a trigger for the AFib, which is probably not the majority of patients, or getting rid of excess substrate and, and, and volume of tissue, we don't know exactly why it helps, but it does seem to reduce the burden of AFib, in particular in patients with triggers who had a more pronounced effect. And in this certainly cherry-picked example of what their loop recorder would look like. This is the example they provided in the paper. A patient who was in AFib continuously for months at a time had their ligation procedure and then their AFib magically goes away. I'm certain that this is not the mean example, but the most ideal example that they could find. But there's some logic for that. And so there was a registry that was created non-randomized where they looked at patients who had a lariat ligation followed by an AFib ablation roughly a month later and compared that to a equal cohort of patients just undergoing AFib ablation. And these were patients with long-standing persistent AFib, so more than a year in duration. And the ablation group, not surprisingly, had a relatively dismal um, rate of recurrence of atrial fibrillation and the group that had the lariat had a, a better outcome. So there's some science behind getting rid of this thing and then performing an AFib ablation and that device is now undergoing a clinical trial, a randomized controlled trial, comparing those two strategies. It's about halfway through enrollment and in terms of safety of that procedure, there's only been one safety endpoint met in the first 161 patients that they submitted back to the FDA. So it seems to be a safe procedure. We'll see it's a, if it's effective. One of the neat hot topics in EP right now is doing both of these things at the same time. So while you're in there doing an AFib ablation, just do a watchman while you're at it. And to very briefly summarize several trials, the AFib ablation and the left atrial appendage occlusion success rates and and endpoints are roughly the same as if you do them standalone, which isn't surprising. There's a few pros to doing that. It's probably more cost effective to the system in, if you can eliminate the payer issues because you're already there, all your resources have been mobilized for that procedure. There may be some safety benefits. You don't have to do a transeptal puncture twice. You don't have to get groin access twice. 
Cost is also a con because payers don't pay for them individually. They're only gonna pay for one at a time. And the other thing that we've seen is if you have a watchman already in place and you do an AFib ablation, there's a huge increase in the number of leaks. So it goes up to about 30% of new leaks after radiofrequency ablation. Why that is, we don't exactly know, but it's something that's been fairly consistent over the different series. And then the other thing is if that patient does have substrate in the appendage itself, it's very challenging to get rid of that once you've physically isolated that structure. So in terms of new devices and technology that, that's out there, Dr. Taylor and I were talking about these 3D printing techniques that people are looking at, which may or may not ever come to fruition, but there's all sorts of new ideas coming out. There are a handful of other devices that aren't really being used right now in the U.S., but we'll probably see in the future. And then the big question is how these compare to novel anticoagulants. There's safety data coming out that the procedure can be done on novel anticoagulants uninterrupted, and you can use novel anticoagulants afterwards. How they compare in terms of stroke prevention, we don't know without a randomized trial. That trial may or probably will not be done, but who knows. Um, and then a changing or evolving threshold for who you recommend this therapy for. In the past, I think we've thought of this as people who really just can't take anticoagulation, but as we've seen the safety profile of this procedure go up significantly, and the success rates are nearly 100%, 100% of our patients have been able to come off anticoagulation, we start to have a lower threshold for recommending this for patients if they've had even minor bleeding on anticoagulation. And that's all I have, if there are any questions. So, so that was great. I, I'll start off with one question. So the, in the beginning when you were talking about the different shapes uh, and risk of stroke, is it shape or is it volume? If people just looked at the volume, because, you know, is it really chicken wings and tubes or just how many cc's are in there? We, we don't know. I don't think there's any data on, on volume that I have seen. Um, that series didn't look at volume. It just looked at morphology description. Any other questions from the group? Would you comment on the kind of considerations for using uh, Lariat versus Watchman in somebody who is having trouble with even short-term use of anticoagulation? So, um, for patients who can take anticoagulation for short term, I think it's clear that Watchman is the preferred technology. And like I said, it's not real common for patients not to be able to tolerate short term. If, if they absolutely can't take anything, I think a Watchman is still probably the safer procedure. Um, we don't have any data until the trial comes out that's enrolling right now. But if they can't even take aspirin, or aspirin and Plavix, then you've got your hands full. And so whether to put that patient through the Larry procedure and then risk not being on aspirin or considering sending that patient to surgery, we've sent a number of patients to surgery who can't take anything and they'll put this little clip on there. Um, there's no data on using only antiplatelet therapy in the Larry device. We don't have any stroke data with the device at all. So if it were me, I'd probably have the Lariat rather than go into open heart surgery. But I would talk to that patient really carefully about, can you take Coumadin for six weeks? Because most people can if you really push them, or Eliquis. Speaking of which, um, there's not any randomized data comparing NOACs to uh, Watchmen. Correct. Um, and the scatter plots that you showed on the cost effectiveness slide showed that the when you did compare to NOx, I guess historically you're getting a little closer to neutral. Uh, do you know if there's any any plans uh, to to do that? I don't know of any randomized trials. I mean, those are pretty expensive, and I can't see that either branch of that technology would have a vested interest in proving themselves wrong because I don't think we know which one would be superior. 
the patients that we see, I would estimate it, it, more than half of them are on novel anticoagulants when they have problems. So overall, novel anticoagulants are better in terms of risk of bleeding, but patients still have a lot of bleeding risk. And it may not be superior in terms of stroke prevention, but the bleeding issues still have to be dealt with. When, uh, you know, you say that uh, nobody has an interest in, in doing the trial because uh, nobody knows which one will be better. I thought that's why we did trials. Well, we, we have uh, no, no, no the answer. So the suggestion I'm getting is that the manufacturers of the devices are nervous that they can't beat the NOACs, uh, and so they're unwilling to do a trial. But it, if, you, if you do close them, are there any patients? Who, who it sounds like everybody's closed. Everybody's off uh, anticoagulation. Who who stays on anticoagulation after uh, so, closing the with the device? So the, to answer your first comment, I think that clinicians are definitely interested in, in a trial like that, and you can find half you know a dozen people immediately to to run that type of trial. But to pay for it, obviously, is a different story. Um, in terms of who needs to stay on anticoagulation, if someone has a persistent thrombus, I think you'd be hard pressed to recommend stopping anticoagulation. And the, the large leaks, which are very rare, you'd have to at least talk to that patient about the possibility of their risk of stroke. There's some indirect data that those big leaks are actually a bigger risk of stroke than the thrombus. So if you look at big series that have looked at how many leaks and, and thrombi form on these things, the presence of a leak larger than five millimeters is actually a stronger predictor for stroke than the thrombus. So leaks are not, they're not uncommon, but fortunately the big ones are uncommon. If they're big, they could be a big deal though. Mike. Uh, you, you made a really nice comment about uh, helping us understand why these leaks happen later. And, uh, and uh, some of that had to do with the size of the left atrium at the time of deployment. I know that some people have been interested in giving saline boluses or saline infusions to maximize the size. Um, so that, can you comment on that? And does that, by maximizing the size of the left atrial appendage, are you more likely to get a better fit and smaller leaks? down the line, um, and then because I'm keeping it short, I'll ask you later in person about the uh, 3D printing. For yeah, I know your friend is involved with that, Habib. So uh, our, at least my practice is to just empirically give saline in the beginning of the procedure. But we always measure left atrial pressure and we want it at least 10. But I'm surprised at how low these left atrial pressures are. I mean, we did a, a patient last week who is just has terrible heart failure and his left atrial pressure was 12. And so you really have to be concerned that you're underestimating the size of that appendage. And the other thing is we make our size adjustment based on TE data, which almost universally underestimates the size of a thing. So when you pick the size of your device based on TE, you're almost always too small. So we've learned to take that size and then add one or maybe two more sizes to it. So Basically, get as big of a device that you can to get in there. You can't go too big. All right. With that, we'll thank you again. That was a really good talk. Thanks, man. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.